The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. John the Baptist appeared, preaching in the desert of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It was of him that the prophet Isaiah had spoken when he said, A voice of one crying out in the desert, Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. John was clothed, wore clothing made of camel's hair and had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locust and wild honey. At that time, Jerusalem, all Judea and the whole region around the Jordan were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they acknowledged their sins. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce good fruit as evidence of your repentance. and Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God can raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Even now the axe lies at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I am baptizing you with water for repentance, but the one who is coming after me is mightier than I. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand. He will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into his barn. And the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. The Gospel of the Lord. These are very, very powerful readings for this second week of Advent. You know, we have this Advent wreath and it has uh, three purple candles and one rose candle. We're on the second purple and then next week we go to rose and then we come back to purple again. And there's something that's been a little lost in our tradition is that purple, as you know, for Lent represents penance. And actually, penance is supposed to be about Advent as well, so that when we go for, through these first two weeks of purple or penance, then we get to rose. And the reason why the church put rose is because it's supposed to be a time of rest. Rest and relaxation from your penance. And then that final purple, get back to it because Holy Christmas is coming. But the difference between Advent and Lent is that in Lent we are taking away, we are honing down, trying to make ourselves better. But in Advent, it really is more of adding to make ourselves better. So that the penance is that we do more in order to come closer to Christ. Certainly during Advent, it's a time of reflection on Mary, on the Virgin Mary. So this might be a wonderful time to spend more time with her. Maybe bring out the rosary again, which maybe has not been prayed for a little while. It's also a time of definitely of reconciliation. And that's what this Sunday is all about. Reconciliation. So in that first reading, you have all the animals that are with each other, right? That just does not happen in the real world. But this is not a dream of the prophet. This is a vision. That means it will come to pass. And we have to be careful not to become so secularized that we don't believe in visions anymore and we don't believe in miracles anymore. Or that we think maybe these things happened a long, long time ago, but they don't happen anymore. Or worse, maybe all of these things we talk about are just mm, metaphors, symbols, but 
the real thing, like a star leading three kings and Mary giving birth and still remaining virgin and Jesus being actually God, maybe is not really so. We're modern people now. This would be a great mistake because in the Catholic faith, in Catholic Church, we are built on miracle. If you don't believe in miracle, you don't believe in Catholic faith. Jesus Christ came down from heaven, became one of us, lived with us, suffered and died. That's why we have a crucifix, not a cross, but a crucifix in every Catholic church. Why? Because it's not the cross that saved you. That didn't produce the miracle. It's the person on the cross that saved you, Jesus Christ. And we place the Lord there in the center of our churches because we never want to forget. It's easy for us to forget. We never want to forget that it was a sacrifice. It was painful. And he did it for love. I've always thought what a wonderful thing that you have Christ with his hands outstretched in that you know, agony. But at the same time, this is the way we embrace each other too, isn't it? When we say, I love you, this is what we do. We put our arms around each other. So forever, this is the, the beautiful image that we have, at least in this world, of Christ's suffering and his love for us. And remember that the Lord could have chosen from all the different creatures of heaven, all the uh, angels and spirits that are there. There are nine choirs of angels, thrones and cherubim and seraphim, dominations, virtues, archangels, guardian angels, and yet he chose to take upon himself our human body, our flesh. And he says, I shall reign this way forever. So even though he has those wounds forever, now they are a badge, a proof of his love, no longer painful, but a reminder to you and to me in eternity, this is how much I loved you, and this is how much I will love you forever. It is an extraordinary thing that the second person of the Trinity fell in love with us so much that he took on our image, and not all the great and more perfect creatures of heaven. Well, of course, he did that to reconcile, to bring us back to the Father. And so today, um, really, the readings, that first, but certainly uh, in the Gospel with John the Baptist, it is about forgiveness. And so this would be a great moment, a great week, to just ponder, where do I need to reconcile? You see, every week is different. Every week has a different theme. But really, the, the theme for this week is where do I have to reconcile? Where is it time to uh, say, I'm sorry? Maybe to make that phone call that you've been putting off. Maybe to send that email. Maybe to send a Christmas card. You know, Christmas cards, Christmas is a, a wondrous time because you can write something, send it off, and it says so much more. So you write, was thinking of you, love, and you send it. And that could break down some kind of distance or something that has grown up between you and the other person. Christmas gives you an excuse to make things better, to reconcile. Maybe it's in your own family. Maybe there's moodiness that goes on. Then say, I'm sorry. Sorry I'm moody. Don't mean to. It's just the way it is, but be patient with me. I know I was moody with my mom and dad when I was a teenager. All I would, they tell me when I was little, I was just a chatterbox, talking, talking, talking. <laughs> Running all over the place, taking all the pans out and throwing them, and they have all these memories. They used to call me a monkey. <laughs> and then I hit teenage years and silent. Didn't really want to talk. And I would go to my room after school, and my parents were completely confused. Didn't know why all of a sudden I was quiet. But it just, 
felt like I needed to be quiet. And um, I know sometimes that was misunderstood as not loving them and maybe not wanting to be a part of them and so forth, but there were deeper things going on. And then all of a sudden, when I got into college, it just was as if I came out of that. And I got very involved again, and I wanted to be a part of things and so forth. So, um, but, you know, after time, you know, you realize that what you do and how you say things, you don't mean to do it or say it that way, but it impacts in a different way. I remember when I had gone out to a party, uh, and I was a young adult, but I was living at home, and I stayed out really late. I hadn't stayed out that late, I think, ever. It was probably about 2 in the morning or something. And I came home very quietly, you know, opened the door, and came in, and guess, there's my mom, guess, you know. And she's just sitting there in a little bit of light, quiet. So I went up, and she said, where have you been? And I said, well, we were out partying. I'm sorry, Mom. You know, it, the time got past me. She said, you could have called. Yeah, I know. I'm really sorry. I said, OK. I said, where's Dad? Oh, he's out looking for you. <laughs> what? <laughs> he's in the truck. He's going up and down streets looking for you because he's sure that something happened, that you got into an accident or something and you might be laying out there in the road and on and on and on. And I thought, oh my gosh. Well, my dad finally came home. We were waiting up, of course. He walked in and he just looked at me and then he went to bed. God bless him. And then the next day we had a talk. And I told him, I said, I will never, never do that to you. Because I realized, wow, it didn't even make sense to me. Why would my dad go out on a truck looking for me? It doesn't make sense. But that's love. That's how much he loved me. And I thought, I don't want to do that. I don't want to make that happen again, that kind of pain. And so I didn't. I, I always was very careful about letting them know, you know, when I was home living there, if I was going to come home late and so forth. And they were fine. They just needed to know. That's all. See, reconciliation, making a change. You know, I didn't have to do that, right? I could have said, well, I'm a big boy now. I'm grown up. Come on. No, I could have, I guess, but that's not finally love. Love is bending. Love is recreating ourselves a little bit for the sake of others. So I hope that this um, time will afford you that opportunity, that chance. Look at your own relationships, family, friends. Can they be better? And if they can, make them better. Let them be happier for you, more peaceful at home. It's worth it. And finally, with the Lord himself, because we often have to reconcile with God. There are things that go wrong and things that we do or say that really uh, we know it's not the way of Christ. And this is the time too to say, Lord, be patient with me. I do love you. I am trying. Give me your grace. Help me. Send your angels, whatever you need to do. But help me to be a better Catholic to love you more. Now one last thing. You have a beautiful choir. And there's a lot of, you know, it's nice to hear you praying. But I will say that um, it's important to sing when you enter into Catholic Mass. Um, I remember too that a long time ago, I, I would come into church and just sit there and be quiet. And it was after a while, it seemed to me, I'm really a spectator. Everybody else, OK, I'm just sitting there. And then I'll leave when Mass is over. 
And a nun told me once, you know what? Sing for heaven's sake. And, and I said, sister, what do you mean? Sing, but I don't feel like, I don't care. She said, I don't care if you feel like it or not. You sing. And she said, after a while, you're going to feel it. And I loved her dearly, and I tried it, and it was hard at first. And then after a while, actually, I really enjoyed it. And I did the same thing with the creed and the Gloria and all these other prayers that we have that sometimes we just kind of zone out. Don't zone out. Jesus is here for you. He loves you, and you need to enter in this moment with him, this relationship that's happening right now, because it may not happen for the rest of the week. There are things that happen, work, school, all sorts of things. But right now you're here, and he's here in the tabernacle, the blessed sacrament. Then open yourselves to him. You want to be Catholic, really? You want to feel Catholic? You want to believe Catholic? Then you need to enter through the door called relationship and prayer with him. Then all things are made good. Reconciliation happens. Mercy and forgiveness are found. And love, the love of God who came down from heaven for you and for me and for our sake and salvation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.